um, I'd now like to talk about brain anatomy. There are various parts of the brain um, that have been categorized and interpreted in different ways. What I'd like to talk about are three general areas and how they relate to learning. So the three areas I'd like to speak about are the lower, middle, and upper brain. The lower brain, or brain stem, is involved largely in survival activities. So things like breathing, uh, heart regulation, sleep. These activities that we don't think about at all are regulated by the brainstem. Additionally, activities related to flight or f fight or flight responses. So when an organism is perceived as being threatened and its survival is being threatened, the organism has to choose between whether to stay or fight or to retreat and flee. So this response is regulated by the brainstem. Additionally, our territorial behaviors are regulated by the brainstem. So things like things that I perceive as my own, I will protect. And these behaviors that cause me to want to protect this thing that I own are regulated by the brainstem activity. So again, very basic to my survival and, and extremely subconscious. I just simply react. As well, social dominance and conformity behaviors are also linked to survival. So we are a group animal and we rely on others to help us survive. So again, these behaviors are regulated by the lower brain. A second group of behaviors that are regulated by the lower brain are, are automatic behaviors. These can include relatively innate reactions as well as learned reactions. So an innate reaction or an instinct would be babies are, have a fear of snakes. So when a baby sees a snake, there's a reaction that they would go through because snakes are innately per perceived as a threat to that organism. To follow along this, beyond the innate uh, capacity of snakes to invoke fear, um, an individual, as they develop, can develop a learned response to snakes. So they can, this can get exacerbated and can result in a snake phobia, or it can get um, decreased and result in, in the individual understanding that not all snakes are dangerous, for example. This also, the automatic behaviors that are regulated by the brainstem also include well-learned skills. So things like, for example, a classic one is driving a car. When we initially learn how to drive a car, we have to think about every single thing we're doing. We need to put on the brake to slow down. We need to put on the blinker to turn. And as we become more and more skilled at this, we don't think about what we're doing at all, and it becomes an automatic behavior that's activated by the lower brain. A final group of automatic behaviors are habits. So these are behaviors that have become quite entrenched and that become extremely difficult to change things like smoking habits. There can be good habits as well. Another group of behaviors that are also controlled by the lower brain are reenactment behaviors. So these are behaviors that relate to routine and ritual. Um, so we develop a sense of routines, things that we do every day, and our routines are actually extremely comforting to us. Um, Oppositely, when routines are changed, this can be perceived as a threat to the individual and can, can, can trigger a stress response. A final comment I want to make about the behaviors that are, um, are initiated by the lower brain is that they are extremely resistant to change. So they're occurring all the time, they're extremely subconscious, and if an individual tries to change these behaviors, they must be brought into consciousness in order to be changed, and this is very difficult to actually do successfully. The second area of the brain I'd like to talk about is the middle brain, or the limbic system. The key element of this brain, and something that's important to understand, is, is that this is the how, where our emotions and feelings are housed. So the limbic system not only creates, but regulates these emotions to a certain extent. An example of the emotions that are key to our survival and the link between the middle and the lower brain are our bonding needs. So we will express um, emotions in order to remain attached to a certain individual that's key to our survival. So this is classic in terms of young children who require individuals for their survival to keep them fed and sheltered and they will react emotionally if they perceive a threat to that relationship in order to try to 
gain proximity to that individual again and, and return to a sense of safety. As well, um, the middle brain has the ability to communicate between both the upper and the lower brain. And because of that, can actually inhibit or support um, the activities of either of these. The final area of the brain I want to talk about is the upper brain. This is also called the neocortex. The major, functioning, uh, the major function of this part of the brain is thought or cognition. This is the creative part of our brain. It uses language. It allows for music appreciation as well as creation of music, complex analysis of facts and uh, perceptions, logical, abstract thought, as well, it, op it allows us the opportunity to anticipate and plan for the future. So this is truly where our intelligence is located. This is by far the largest part of our brain, occupying five-sixths of our brain itself. Now, I mentioned at the outset that our brain is extremely multifaceted. I want to comment quickly on the interconnectedness of these brain areas. All three brains or areas of our brain are working all the time to influence our behavior, meaning that they influence the decisions made by the separate parts of the brain. So while they all have separate functions and capacities, they are interacting with each other and influencing each other all the time. Now, these relationships can be either supportive or in conflict. So an organism, the, the parts of the brain will work together or in conflict to decide what is the most appropriate spawn, response to um, the environment. For example, if the organism perceives a threat to its survival, the lower brain and middle brain will take over and dominate and influence behavior, while the upper brain or neocortex is inhibited, is not acting. So the, the example here is that I want to communicate that the elements of learning of concepts and emotions as well as automatic behaviors cannot be separated from one another. The three brains are working all the time to influence the ability of the child to learn. A second quick point about the interconnectedness of the brain is that memory um, is influenced by how the brain is functioning. Memory is mediated by the middle brain or the limbic system and as you recall the limbic system is our, also our emotional center of the brain. Meaning that memories are um, enhanced or inhibited by emotion. So if I'm in a positive and emotional state um, when I'm learning something new, this would encourage my memory of that, of that concept. Versus if I'm in a negative emotional state and I'm perceiving a threat, the lower brain will take over, I'll try to deal with the threat and it would inhibit my memory of that concept. As well, if you think about how children approach different topics, so if a, if a child feels that they hate math, for example, this is a very negative emotional state and they're not, it's going to limit their ability to actually be open and learn the concepts of math versus being in a positive emotional state um, of loving math and feeling very positive about it and they will be able to learn these concepts more effectively. The key point here is that if we ignore the emotional components of any subject that's being learned, we'll deprive children of the meaningfulness of the subject. So emotion uh, links with meaning and by having a positive emotion associated with a topic or something being learned it becomes more meaningful to the child and makes it easier and more likely that they're to learn that topic. The next point I want to just comment on briefly is the notion of perception. So the brain is constantly looking for ways to perceive and seek patterns to create meaning and to make connections as well as to integrate sensory experience. So it's important to, rec or to recognize that the brain is actively looking for these things. It's always trying to make sense of the world around it as well as the internal state of the individual and to reconcile those, those elements.